let us let us begin. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, uh, to this uh, seminar uh, in the Development Studies Seminar Series on uh, agrarian questions now and then. My name is Jens Lerke. I am uh, the editor of Journal of Agrarian Change, and I'm chairing this session. Uh, can I? Uh, I'll first briefly introduce you to the panel here, uh, and then we will uh, uh, proceed by presentation. Uh, from each member of the panel. We've got Henry Bernstein here, we've got Barbara Harris-White, and we've got Jan Dauer van der Plerk here. Uh, you, you may notice that uh, the fourth member of the panel, Terry Byers, is absent. Unfortunately, he is unwell, so could not make it today. But uh, Henry Bernstein will cover some of his views just to make sure that those views are, are represented anyway. Anyway, let, let, let me say a, a few more words by way of introduction, and then we can start. Uh, I will introduce the, the speakers uh, to, uh, to, uh, in some more details. And I'll start with uh, uh, P Professor Barbara Harris-White, who is the director of Wolfson's College South Asia Research Cluster and of Area Studies Research Project on the Materiality of India's Informal Economy, also at Oxford University. She was also the founder director of Oxford University's Contemporary South Asia Studies Program. Um, and the organizer of the world's first MSc in contemporary India. Now, of course, SOAS has one too, but, uh, <laughs> so, but as it were, this was the first one. Um, she's written numerous books and articles, of course, um, and ju just to mention two, um, uh, uh, India Working from 2003, I think, um, and uh, Rural Commercial Capital, which won the uh, Edgar Graham Prize here at SOAS. She works more generally on India's political economy, in particular on food and energy, and on aspects of uh, deprivations, all through field research. She has more or less single-handedly established the field of study of agrarian markets and agrarian traders in India, with a focus on rice traders in mainly two Indian states. She has also been a driving force in the, in, in the recognition of the role of petty commodity producers in, in the non-agrarian economy. And she is today Emeritus Professor in, uh, of Development Studies in, in, in Oxford, Emeritus Fellow of Wolfson College, Oxford, and a Professorial Research Associate here at SOAS in Development Studies. Um, Henry Bernstein is an emeritus professor as well of development studies here at SOAS. He has worked for several d decades on the political economy of agrarian change, social theory, peasant studies, and on the rural economy of South Africa. He has taught and researched in many different countries, Turkey, Tanzania, uh, South Africa, the US, and the UK, and he came to SOAS in 1995. Uh, uh, from 85 till 2000, he was co-editor with Professor Terry Bias of the Journal of Peasant Studies. And then he became uh, the founding editor, still with Terry Bias, of the Journal of Agrarian Change from 2001 till 2008. He is now an emeritus editor of that journal. He has been part and parcel of defining peasant studies, or as he prefers to call it today, the study of, of agrarian change. From his early argument that today's peasantry in sub-Saharan Africa should be understood as petty commodity producers within capitalism to the, his, his development of the position that classic agrarian transition in the global south is no longer on the cards and to coining the concept classes of labor encompassing petty producers, seasonal workers and the like, he's had a major I impact of the discipline. His book, Class Dynamics of Agrarian Change, has been translated into, he thinks, nine languages, but he's not quite sure. It might be more. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat little uh, difficult introduction to his thoughts. Um, let me mention Professor Terry Bias, who is not here. Uh, he is also an emeritus professor at, of SOAS in the economics department, where he has taught since, where he taught since uh, 62. I won't say much because Henry will, will say more, but he has been a central figure for the study of, of a grand political economy across the globe for half a century, both through his own work and through creating uh, and being a central part of running the two most important uh, agrarian political e economy journals that, that I've already mentioned, Journal of, 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 of Agrarian Change and Journal of Peasant Studies. Finally, uh, Jan Dauer van der Plerk, 
holds the chair of rural sociology at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and is also an adjunct professor of rural sociology at the China Agricultural University in Beijing. Jan Dauer combines practical insights into agriculture. He holds a degree as agriculture engineer and he runs his own farm, as far as I'm aware. Uh, uh, he, he, he combines that with the study of rural sociology and development sociology. He's also an activist clo closely involved in some of the grassroots initiatives aiming to develop practical new alternatives to the reigning model of ongoing scale increase and further industrialization of agriculture. His book, The New Peasantry's Struggles for Autonomy and, and Sustainability in an Era of Empire and Globalization, where he argues that in many parts of the world, a process of re is taking place of a peasantry that does not fit the prevailing industrialized ag agricultural model, could be seen as a political statement as well, taking the sides of the peasantry. Another important book of his is uh, Peasants and the Art of Farming, uh, Shainovian Manifesto, which in many ways points in a different direction to that of a classic agrarian political economy. Um, so with that brief introduction, which no doubt uh, will be deemed as incorrect and <laughs> found wanting by some of the people here, but then they can correct it as they come to it, we will proceed. Uh, each member of the panel will have 15 minutes to, uh, for their uh, uh, first statement, uh, although I've asked Henry Bernstein to cover for Terry Byers as well. So he will, he will be given 25 minutes altogether. And I think we should start with him uh, as the representative of, of uh, the, the variety of agrarian change studies that, that exist at SOAS and continue from there. Henry, and please, if you would mind. Well, it's great to see this audience, a uh, very intergenerational audience too. Um, I don't know whether anyone gasped when Jens reported that uh, Terry Byers joined SAMAS in 1962, which does indeed make him a historic figure. Um, and I get very sentimental about the Department of Development Studies when I was head of department from 2000 to 2003. I inherited four permanent staff members and four temporary lecturers in the department, a very far cry from where the department is today, and it's gone from strength to strength. Um, so had Terry been here, he would have presented this brief overview of agrarian studies at SOAS. Um, and I'm sure he would have done a more satisfactory job than I can. I haven't researched this um, thoroughly enough. Uh, Terry would have been very precise about names and dates and so on. I'm just going to give some uh, impressions. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you that Terry's not seriously ill. Uh, he has a peculiar condition which sometimes afflicts older people, which is that he gets dizzy spells. It's not really medically harmful or dangerous, but um, it means he has to restrict his activities, which if you knew Terry, you'd realize is very frustrating for him. He's somebody of great energy and who would love to be at an, an occasion like this. Now, also, because he's not here, it means I can center my brief overview of agrarian studies at SAS around Terry's career here in full appreciation. He arrived in 62 as a research fellow, became a lecturer in 64, and then went to India for a year, which I think was a deeply formative experience for him. He became connected to and deeply involved with um, a really golden generation of agrarian political economists uh, in India. Uh, and I think, in a sense, was a, an honorary or adopted member of that particular uh, golden circle. Saras, when he arrived, was a very, very different place than it is now. And he would be able to explain how and why. It was still perhaps trying to escape from the legacies of its colonial and imperialist foundations. Social sciences at SARS then were still um, very young. Uh, they hadn't grown to the sort of scale and um, indeed diversity that they have today. So there were 
people of various kinds at SOAS working on agrarian and more broadly rural issues, which was not surprising because at that time, most of the countries of Africa and Asia were, of course, still predominantly rural, still predominantly agricultural economies, however much they were trying to escape from that in their plans for national development, industrialization, and so on, after independence. And that was very, very um, important to Terry. I mean, he, his earliest writings on India concerned planning, especially how to plan national development, how to plan for industrialization, which for Terry was central, is central uh, to development. And I think his interest in agrarian issues and agrarian change in India came about through, through that process, or through that interest. Now, a very key moment here was 1973, when Terry started the Peasant Seminar at the University of London, which ran for 15 years, from 1973 to 1988. And he has a wonderful account of it, uh, which is really is a piece of living history, in the third issue of the Journal of Agrarian Change, in the first volume in 2001. And I think over those years there were 208 papers presented to the Peasant Seminar, and it is, and, and those who presented them are a kind of roll call of the great and the good in critical social sciences um, at that time, not only from Britain, of course, but very, very uh, international, in fact. And from the seminar series and the papers that were presented to it came the Journal of Peasant Studies, which Terry founded in 1973. Um, this was tremendously important. We have some people in the audience, I suspect, who, who grew up as graduate students, as research students uh, in the Journal of uh, Peasant Studies and who have contributed to it and to the Journal of Agrarian Change, which started in 2001. Now, what is very remarkable about the first 12 years of the Journal of Peasant Studies was that Terry edited it virtually single-handed. He was a great animator, as they say in French, a great activator. Of course, this is not about one person, but I think his imagination, his energies, his sympathies engaged very, very wide networks of agrarian scholars who wanted their work to appear in the Journal of Peasant Studies. In 1985, I joined him as co-editor, and we edited together thereafter until 2000. Um, what were the main preoccupations and concerns of the Journal of Peasant Studies from the 1970s onwards? Um, and this is discussed in greater depth in an article in the first issue of Journal of Agrarian Change, where Terry and I reviewed some 30 years or so of agrarian political economy as represented principally but not exclusively within the Journal of Peasant Studies. So I think the shape and identity that Terry was so important in giving to the journal and to everything that spun off it and into it was the idea of agrarian political economy. Well, what is that? I'm sure if I asked you to recite it, you would all know from the mission statement of the Journal of Agrarian Change, which is... Uh, it was to promote investigation of the social relations and dynamics of production, property and power in agrarian formations and their processes of, of change, historical and contemporary. And that was, I think, I think that, that sort of statement really is a very good summary of, of Terry's concerns and his achievements um, over the years. Historically, this meant revisiting classic debates about original agrarian transitions to capitalism in Western Europe and also in Japan. And in contemporary terms, it meant looking at the prospects of agrarian transition in the newly independent countries uh, of, of the South. So that was the contemporary uh, thrust of uh, Terry's interest and also what, what the journal did. And this included issues of well, what was blocking or preventing 
agrarian transition in the countries of the South where that hadn't taken place. And an important sub-component of that interest, that theme, was the effects of colonialism on agrarian structures um, in the South. Um, for Terry, it was always clear, though this was not uh, a monopoly or dogmatic position in the journal, that the interest in the growing change was to see whether or not it helped develop industrialization in the countries of the South and, and the reasons um, for that. And that included, at least for a time, which is probably behind us for the moment, also looking at experiments of socialist construction in uh, the agricultural sectors of, of certain countries in the South. There was a great interest, as you can imagine, in China, what was happening in China, what was happening in Vietnam, and in several other instances, more uh, recent cases, for example, Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, and so on. There was also very strong interest in peasant politics. Um, 1969, Eric Wolf published his great book, Peasant Wars of the 20th Century, which argued that peasant revolutions were actually key to the formation of the modern world in the 20th century. Dating Wolf's examples, I would say this was particularly so from about the 1910s um, to the 1970s. So one should recall um, this is actually living history for some of us here, but perhaps past history, well past history for many of the students, was that in the 1970s, the last of Wolf's great, or the last great example of Wolf's peasant wars was still taking place in Vietnam until the victory of the National Liberation Front in 1975. Now, something else about this political economy, which it's worth mentioning, if only briefly, and Jens reminded me of, is it was very anti-populist. It was very anti-agrarian populist. And I was rereading Terry's account of, the, of the, the peasant seminar, and he says, in 1966, three very important books appeared. One was uh, Barrington Moore's Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, Another was Eric Wolf's very small but incredibly impressive book on peasants, um, which I reread this year and I was impressed even more than uh, I could recall from before. And Terry said these were not Marxist works necessarily, but these were works by people who were sympathetic to a Marxist perspective, who took class seriously and so on, and therefore they fed into the current of interest in agrarian studies that soon afterwards led to the seminar and led to the journal. The third important book that appeared in that year, 1966, was the first full English translation of Chayanov's theory of peasant economy. And Terry said, this did not have the same effect on us because we rejected um, the kind of support, theoretical intellectual support, to agrarian populism that Chayanov's book was uh, uh, led to. And, and I, this, of course, is a big story. It may come up in our discussion. I, I uh, perhaps I'm a bit less implacable uh, in, my, in my view of that. Um, but in any case, uh, as Terry says, quite rightly, that looking back, writing a retrospect of the Peasant Seminar and the Journal of Peasant Studies, it was not as uh, dogmatic as some of its critics like to say. In fact, I just recalled coming here on the tube that um, there were two special issues of the Journal of Peasant Studies presenting previously untranslated work by Chayanov. So it wasn't that there was a battle of ideas, if you like, uh, with populism, but not, um, not, not, not a sort of a dogmatic um, dismissal or refusal uh, to engage it. Now, as far as SOAS is concerned, and here I, I'm not going to read out a list of names, but people are welcome to mention names if they wish to, through the influence of 
Terry himself and other colleagues at SAAS through the influence of the seminar, through the influence of the journal, there are several more generations of very able, important, younger political economists of a growing change. Some of them still at SOAS. They loved it so much they couldn't leave when they finished their PhDs. Others now at other universities uh, and working elsewhere. And I think that is really a very, very critical aspect of, crucial aspect of uh, Terry's achievement and of this tradition, if you like, um, of a growing political economy at SOAS, that it has been reproduced. It's been, and it's been, and it's been reproduced, it's reproduced itself in times that have been very, very hard for the left intellectually, ideologically, um, politically, uh, and so on. Um, I would say one example of that, um, that success story, just to embarrass him, but he happens to be sitting in front of you, is, is Jens Lerke, who managed to get himself the very nice title at SOAS of uh, Reader in Agrarian and Labour Studies, which I think is, from my point of view, is, is, is what so much of this um, is about. So I think that's probably enough, although I'm very happy for others to add anything that I may have missed here. It is exactly 15 minutes, so yes. That was 15, I'm sorry, I thought it would be quicker. So now I've got the job of um, presenting some of Terry's ideas. He's written very widely on all sorts of things, including very interesting ways on Scottish folk music. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on the framework that came out of an extremely important seminal article that he wrote uh, in, in the early 1990s. And um, in it, he distinguished three meanings of the agrarian question, the classic agrarian question um, in Marxism. First is the development of capitalism in farming and its effects for raising productivity. The second is agrarian transition understood as the ways in which agriculture contributes to industrialization. And then the third is class political struggles over agrarian change, both from above and from below. Now I'm just going to show you my own extremely concentrated summary of... And we, the, it has to be quick because... Yeah, yeah, the historical case studies from, um, from Terry's uh, seminal article. So the first part of agrarian transition that he looked at was that of England, the classic, the original transition. And I'm not going to go into details here. If you're not familiar with this and it looks fascinating, then you have to go and read it for yourself. Um, but I just want to draw attention to that first um, row at the top. Peasants and landlords, the form of production that emerged in the transition and the character of the uh, transition. Then he did a similar exercise for Prussia between the 16th and 19th centuries, especially 19th century, um, as uh, agrarian transition through class struggle from above. Then he did um, a, a, a an analysis of the path of agrarian transition historically in the USA. Prussia and the USA, he later elaborated in a very important book called Capitalism from Above and from Below, where he takes the Prussian and American case studies because these were just noted as examples, though not explored in depth, by Lenin and regarded by Lenin as very important as showing different paths from what happened in England, the original uh, agrarian transition. Then he looked at Japan, late 19th and 20th century, and then at South Korea. Um, first of all, in the Japanese colonial period, in the first half of the 20th century, and then after World War II from the 1950s, 1960s. His interest in selecting these case studies was that they all of countries that were deemed to have 
successfully industrialize. Now, I just want to make a few quick comments about, yep, yeah, about um, Terry's framework, uh, which I have discussed a great deal. He and I disagree. And we, this has led to something that Carlos Oya calls the Bernstein bias debate. Is the Bernstein bias debate or bias Bernstein? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's alphabetical order. Maybe it's Bernstein bias. And the points I want to make, which I'll take up maybe further in presenting my own views, is that, first of all, Terry's interest in all this, I think, derived, well, both from his days as a research student, which was spent looking at Scottish economic history, um, his interest in the first agrarian question, the development of capitalism in farming. And in India, this was concentrated, especially around the Green Revolution in India from the late uh, 1960s. So the question for him was, why hadn't India experienced an agrarian transition, that is a transition to an industrialized economy, the second agrarian question here, um, like the historical case studies he'd, he'd examined. And um, this question and the way of investigating it was generalized to other zones uh, of the South after the end of um, colonialism. Now, several observations about this approach. One is that it's what I call internalist. If you look at that first row, it's basically looking at and seeking to find explanation in class relations that are internal to the countryside. So different types of classes of labor, peasants and others, and different types of classes of landed um, property. It was also very much internal to particular countries. You know, these were, this was about national paths of, of development. So that's why I call it internalist. Second, his findings were original and provocative, especially that this kind of um, transition, the agrarian question three, you could have a transition to industrialization, sorry, agrarian question two, without the development of capitalism in farming. Now, that certainly was a departure from some of the more established Marxist orthodoxies, let's say. So his East Asian examples in particular seem to suggest that it was possible to have that agrarian transition, second agrarian question, without the first happening, that is the the first, uh, the development of capitalist relations in agriculture. And I think the, something that dramatizes this very well is that Terry also thought this applied to the United States in the 19th century, or at least the northern United States, that it was very dynamic, petty commodity production. It wasn't capitalist farming in his sense, i.e. big farms with wage labor. And I think this shows that actually the principal mechanism in his account is ways in which surpluses are transferred from agriculture to industry. So in a sense, the form of production, relations of production and so on in agriculture are secondary, become secondary to the ability of others, particularly states, to extract a surplus from agriculture and use it as an industrial accumulation fund. This was particularly true if, and if you look at his work of the East Asian example. So the state became very, very important. And that means that in practice, in Terry's own work, in my view, the third agrarian question, class and political struggle, does not actually play a very central role in his analysis in his arguments, with that exception of a growing transition from above, where the state plays a central role in effecting 
a transfer of surplus from agriculture to towards infant industrialization, if you like. And one of the key sources of inspiration of that was actually from the Soviet Union in the 1920s and the ideas of Prebozhensky. Prebozhensky's question was, how do you achieve industrialization in a predominantly agrarian, indeed predominantly peasant economy? Another thing is the question that Terry took over and, um, and informed his work. Um, otherwise, on politics, although he didn't write that extensively about populism other than critiquing it in, in academic and intellectual work like that of Michael Lipton, he did write, wrote, write an absolutely incredible long essay on a very important figure in India, Charan Singh, who was a populist leader presented himself as being at the head of India's peasantry and even became Prime Minister of India for a short time. And I think that's a wonderful, vivid, concrete, dialectical analysis uh, that he presented on um, populism in practice, populist politics in the real world, rather than simply in the imagination of Michael Lipton and other uh, academics um, that Terry objected to. Now, since in more recent years, on the whole, he has pursued more historical work. So the book on the historic agrarian transitions in Prussia and the United States that I mentioned, and now he's completing, although he said he's been completing it for at least three years, so you'll hope to see it very soon, is a study of 18th century Scotland. He is Scot Scottish, by the way, and this tries to look at both, here, <laughs> both the agrarian transition in Scotland in the 18th century, early 19th century, and the political economy that grew up in Scotland, the, the extraordinary flowering of political economy that took off in Scotland in the second half of the 18th century. So... So, so, this, so, so this was Henry standing in for, for Terry Bias. Now it's Henry standing in for himself. <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> yep. I really do wish Terry was here, I can tell you. Right, okay, so um, Jens, please keep me to time. I'm, 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 I think I'm, I, it feels from here as if I'm missing out so much, but clearly. Okay, now um, the title of this seminar, I think, is The Growing Questions Then and Now, isn't it? Which was a title I uh, coined in my critical appreciation of Terry's book um, on uh, Prussia and the United States. And it struck me, of course, that if one approaches things in the proper historical manner, as Terry has always done, then then and now, the then in then and now has to be broken down into when we're talking about and where we're talking about, the different and very different times and places of um, the history of capitalism. Now, I'm going to present I'll try and do it quickly, what I think are some key themes in agrarian change and the questions uh, that go with them. And the first set of themes and questions can be framed as internal to the countryside. So these include the questions that were at the centre of Terry's um, analysis of different paths of agrarian transition that I've just um, introduced. The first, I think, absolutely fundamental is what I call the commodification of subsistence. Well, I didn't call it that. Robert Brenner called it that, but I've taken up that phrase as very potent and, and very useful. Um, are peasant farmers able to reproduce themselves outside competitive market exchange of what they produce, sale of output, and how they produce it, purchase of inputs? Secondly, commodification of land. Does agrarian transition necessarily involve dispossession of peasants, 
small or family fathers, farmers, whether by direct means, the enclosure model, which Marx used mostly in relation to England, or indirect means, that's crises of reproduction of small farmers or peasants exerted by market pressures. Third question, how are new classes of capitalist landed property, agrarian capital, and wage labor formed? By what means and with what effects? This was central to the debates about the English transition and very much informed uh, Terry's comparative analysis. How, in what forms, and how far does accumulation of capital in the means of agricultural production, land, and instruments of labor Proceed. Fifth, is there accumulation from above and or from below, the latter through the class differentiation of farmers? And class differentiation of peasant farmers was really, again, one of Terry's central themes and even led him to criticise Robert Brenner for leaving it out of his account of the, the English transition. And sixth, what are the effects for production growth in farming realized through the development of the productive forces and especially growth in labor pro pro productivity? Growth in labor productivity, one of the absolutely central themes of all political economy, as you may know. Now, it seems to me that there are two further themes which push against limiting such processes of change to social forces within the countryside. Here we have to go beyond what I call the internalist problematic. First, rural, so, so rural-urban interconnections. On the side of capital, what is the significance and its effects of a growing capital beyond the countryside that invests in farm production directly or indirectly, the latter, for example, through contract farming? Here I would include and it's a massive debate, I'm just mentioning it. Here I would include merchant capital, which has been very much um, emphasized in the work of Jairus Banerjee and which has been pursued through amazing fieldwork in contemporary India by Barbara Harris White. And on the side of labor, what is the significance of rural labor beyond the farm involving rural industrialization? older and more contemporary forms, or regular rural labor migration as vital elements of the incomes and reproduction of classes of labor in the countryside, even where they engage in some uh, own account farming. So let's say just roughly, really roughly, there are probably 300 million um, regular migrant workers from the countryside in China and India today, at least 300 million. They are often counted as peasants in official statistics and surveys of, of various kinds. <coughs> so those themes, seven and eight, together with six, point towards the place of agriculture within larger national economies. And that, of course, is connects with that interest of Terry Byers. How does agriculture, agricultural change and growth contribute to industrialization to produce what he calls agrarian transition? Do particular states facilitate, hinder or block the transfer of agricultural surplus to industrial accumulation, directly or indirectly, and the development of a home market integrating exchange between agriculture and industry. To simplify it with horrible crudeness, this was the big story for Terry and a number of leading Indian political economists in the 60s and 70s and 80s was that the Indian state was unable to properly tax landed property and capitalist farmers, rich peasants in India to secure the funds that could have been invested in developing industrialization more rapidly in India. And here's a final theme. What are the character and effects of the capitalist world economy? 
What are the effects for agrarian change in particular places at particular times of the formation and interactions of international divisions of labor and agricultural production, international trade and agricultural commodities, how trade is organized and financed, and international investment in agriculture, and the effects of the international state system um, and how it changes. How long have I got? Got seven minutes. Okay. So, what I want to uh, say is that um, these. Uh, no, what I'm going to say is this. Uh, earlier this year, I was on a panel in Toronto with Jan Dower, where we had a lot of fun talking about 50 years of peasant studies, was it? Something like that. Um, you know, what's changed and, and so on. So I'm going to recap briefly some of the things I said then. I think what has changed in the current moment compared to the then of at least 50 years ago is that there are no longer peasant revolutions that were so key to the 20th century. And those peasant revolutions and the questions they raised, the excitement they generated, was what brought many people of my generation of the left into agrarian uh, political economy. Now, I think this is connected, though not necessarily very directly. We no longer have state socialist experiments in agriculture. Now, state socialist agriculture has vanished in virtually every country of the world. Um, also, what has changed since then is um, so-called globalization or neoliberal globalization and its impact that's my type four question, um, especially but not exclusively how it affects patterns and trajectories of agriculture in different places of the capitalist world economy. And not least, which is a preoccupation of my own, the accelerated decomposition of small farmers into classes of petty commodity producers, those who are able to reproduce themselves more or less through their own farming, and rural classes of labor, which reproduce themselves primarily by selling their labor power. Now, arguments from globalization can easily acquire an externalist bias, just as there can be an internalist bias um, from the first six questions. However, I just want to make two points here. First, they don't apply, the type four questions don't only apply to capitalism today, although we undoubtedly live in an era of accelerated uh, and, and uh, of accelerated um, capitalist international economy. Um, and I noted some examples of how the international economy was important in earlier periods of um, agrarian change. Um, however, and this is my argument against the externalist bias, the sort of world system determinism, is that the variable effects of globalization in different places for different agrarian structures represent new or changing conditions for the investigation of the other types of questions that I outlined. Um, it's interesting that there is a kind of version of globalization as this great steamroller both on the right, for those who love it, and on the left, for those who hate it, as if it incorporates a kind of simplifying tendency so that things are moving towards more or less equivalent um, conditions everywhere. And I think one needs to investigate, as I say, the impacts of globalization, all their variability through those earlier questions. And then I'm going to finally, this is my final, just mention three brief points about um, changes in the last 50 years that I mentioned in, um, in Toronto. First of all, and it can't be overstated, is the importance of feminist work in the social sciences, not least for the investigation of social relations of property, production, income and consumption, or consumption slash reproduction, and I think especially potent in agrarian studies because of the continuing power of household models 
in agrarian political economy. Uh, established, for example, in highly influential ways by Chernoff. A second thing that I think has, is, is of more recent provenance and enriches as well as challenging the, the intellectual agenda of, of studies of agrarian change is the importance of environmental change and arguments that today's globalization of industrialized technologies of farm production are causing irreparable environmental damage. And then finally, I don't know who's next, is it Barbara or Yandao? Barbara. Okay, well, if you can remember this for Yandao. Finally, one must note the revival and vitality of agrarian populist politics today, which might not have been anticipated 30 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. For example, as exemplified by the transnational social movement, La Via Campesina, which means the peasant way. And Jan Dauer is one of the leading theorists and intellectual advocates of a peasant way, which is formulated, illustrated, applied in a whole number of works. Uh, the peasant way is a pro political project to recognize, consolidate, and expand peasant farming as the basis of a more equitable and sustainable mode of agriculture than that characterizing capitalism and certainly characterizing uh, capitalist globalization. And I've spent many, many happy hours, days, weeks, I don't know what it adds up to, debating these um, issues in very comradely fashion uh, with Jan Dauer, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that from him a bit later. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. For, for this and for, for the way you positioned your view in relation to world systems determinism and internal determinism and open the debates that we will no doubt return to as well. Barbara, over to you now. Uh, and maybe that was in, in parts of what Henry said also uh, uh, something for you to s s set off from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Firstly, I feel extraordinarily privileged to be um, in this session because um, Henry has grounded it in the history of agrarian studies in SARS and I was, um, I failed to be appointed to a job in SARS in 1971. Um, I came very late to the fold of SARS. I was only, uh, I had to be retired before I had some kind of status in SARS. And uh, yet, where I have worked, Oxford is a sort of offshore satellite of SOAS, a very inferior one, I think. Um, I have also failed to produce a PowerPoint. I have no excuse. I'm very sorry for this. Um, and, but what I'm going to talk about is the political economy of staple commodity markets, which generally everyone falls asleep um, thinking about, but why I find them very exciting. And I want to begin with Henry Bernstein's interest in the expanded concept of the agrarian, which he's just talked about. Um, that accumulation and vertical concentration upstream and downstream of landed agricultural production, including the power of mighty state institutions, marketing boards and so on and so forth, have had a very important role to play both in agrarian transitions and agrarian transformations. The transition, as he said, the changes necessary for capitalism in agriculture and then industry, not only differentiating out, differentiating out to capital and labor, but also um, transforming the peasantry to petty producers, which then differentiate out into capital and labor through states of disguised wage work formally subordinated to traders and moneylenders' capital, or who persist as petty producers, um, independently involved in markets. Um, and what I would say is that, whereas agrarian scholarship has focused on the concept of transition, there's a lot to be said about 
continuing research on transformations because agriculture doesn't stay still and nor do agricultural markets. And so I want to, I, I want to address some theoretical and methodological issues about why they don't stand still, but they produce extremely interesting paradox. How can you have a, agricultural growth without agricultural accumulation? How can you have a great expansion of wage labor without an expansion of landlessness? Um, why does petty production persist and isn't transient and can't be wished away as an archaic form of, of, of social um, exchange? And why is petty produ production so very common and not residual or something down which we look through a microscope? It's just in our face everywhere. This draws our attention to the importance of exchange in agrarian studies. And here I want to pay tribute to Krishna Bharadwaj, who theorized the different exchange relations of a differentiated peasantry. But her market, the market on which um, traders transacted, was completely abstract in her seminal paper. Um, and Badri also, in his great work on exchange, had producers as tenants, and the market was a kind of great um, conflagration of landlords, traders, moneylenders. Um, and uh, surplus was appropriated through rent and interest in the second example, and through buying and selling in Krishna Bharadwaj's example. So these characterizations of commodity markets were very useful to think with, but they were nowhere related to ground realities in which there were multiple appropriate modes of appropriation of surplus in the post-harvest system of markets. Surplus value of rent, of labor um, in production, rent through interlock contracts with commodities, um, all kinds of exploitation on um, the, the real markets in which produce petty traders and petty capitalists have to transact in. They have to rent premises, they have to borrow money, they buy raw materials, they sell finished products. All those markets have relations of exchange and the possibilities of exp exploitation. And a great deal of research still needs to be done about those kinds of relations of exchange throughout the system of buying and selling that is the post-harvest market. In India, 95% of all firms have fewer than five laborers. The average uh, labor uh, force has come, uh, per firm has declined from three to two since 1991. Under the labor laws, all these firms are classified as labor. So you have labor exploiting labor. And under the laws, the way in which these firms are configured um, uh, means that the state declasses petty capital and disenfranchises lab franchises labor at the same time. So these archetypes are useful to think w with and have been very influential in shaping state legislation. But the reality has to kind of um, move in and out of these archetypes. The political economy of markets starts, as Henry suggested, with marks on merchant capital. This is, has been slightly distorted and very influential. Marx explained that when you buy and sell, you're doing something which is not productive because you're not changing the physical character of that thing. But it's necessary for the reproduction of society, including the reproduction of production. He also said that the developmental role of that kind of capital was ambivalent. On the one hand, it speeds up the fact that there are specialized traders speed up the realization of capital. By concentrating capital, they expand the possibilities for productive investment. And um, uh, Marx says they cosmopolitanize um, capital. On the other hand, um, they divert capital from productive use. D investing it in buying and selling is not investing it in something which is directly productive. Uh, merchant's capital destroys production for use, for subsistence, and it me at, at its worst, it simply mediates between owners of surplus. But the point made by Marx, by Henry, 
and by anybody who goes out to do field work on markets, is, is that actually existing commercial capital is much more complicated. If you're a merchant, you can buy, sell, broker. You can uh, transport, store, and process. You can finance production. You can finance trade. Yes? So what a, a trading firm actually does is a great mix of things which are unproductive in the Marxian sense, but necessary, with things that are productive and also necessary. And in India, a lot of theorists in the middle part of the 20th century, very influential theorists, felt that a lot of this activity was unproductive and not necessary as well, which is one of the roots of the enormous edifice of state trading um, in the subcontinent. So in this sense, markets and capitalist firms in markets can be considered to be potentially active in the formation of classes in markets as well as in production. So there are a whole slew of research questions which people are still not addressing about how this is done. Um, in 2012, Ali Jan, who's, where is he? Ah, oh, who's got off the floor. <laughs> and I published a paper in Economic and Political Weekly where we outlined three roles that agricultural markets perform which need research. One is the efficiency role. This is the role that's um, stressed in American textbooks on e agricultural economics. But what it draws our attention to in political economy is the terms of competition between firms, um, th the evolution of firms through vicious competition um, to uh, buy at least uh, at lowest price and sell at highest price. And there's a big debate about whether you can actually make inferences from data on prices, which is all there is, or whether you have to go out in the field and get accounts and look at rates of return, which is supposed to be very difficult. It is very difficult. Anyway, the efficiency role of markets is important even to political economists, because without that, we don't know how well the signs from consumers are transmitted back through the system of markets to producers. Yes? So, although it's common to sort of wish this away as saying, oh, this is bourgeois economics, this is not for the political economy of agriculture, I think it's still very important. There is then an exploitive role of markets, uh, of post-harvest market systems, insofar as firms have labor forces and labor forces um, uh, receive uh, wages which are less than what they produce. So that's a kind of secondary appropriation of labor um, where, uh, where the primary lo location of the appropriation of labor is in agricultural production itself. So markets are exploitive. They are also extractive. And Henry didn't say um, much about this, but Terry Byers has, in the 60s and 70s, wrote terribly influentially about the terms of trade, as did Ashok Mitra. Um, and the way in which the terms of trade can affect class formation. They can affect capital and labor in agriculture, and they can affect capital and labor in industry. Um, we can study it through studying prices, again, which are the, state, the data that's available, although this hasn't been done for a very long time. Um, whether the, the long-term trend of industrial prices is um, against agriculture or whether uh, against the long-term trend of agricultural prices, or whether it's for, okay. Um, so, those three roles are three ways in which um, a wide range of theories and a wide range of approaches to the study of the economy can be mobilized to look at the role of firms in markets and their relation to class formation. And I wanted to finish with three case studies, but I've got five minutes. I don't know how, how I'll do this. But um, what I want to say is that class formation within the system of markets and in agriculture itself is quite complicated. Now, Ali Jan is sitting there in row three and will tell us when provoked in question and answer about at least two ways in which rural commercial capital um, uh, 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 originates from agriculture and trade in the Pakistan 
Punjab. Henry used um, a method, filia viviria, which he developed um, into a kind of political economy of um, stages of transactions after the harvest um, in an influential paper published in 1996. Um, it is a massive development of a very um, uh, simple approach to the study of markets, which is basically follow a sack, which leaves a lot of things out. Henry has started to bring a lot of things in. And what he shows is that the concentrations of power upstream and downstream of landed property um, reproduced white landed and commercial property and reproduced the black workers as a labor force. Um, I've used a slightly different approach, which um, owes a lot to the idea of systems, and it translates in the field into interviews with large numbers of traders and money lenders, in which questions are interspersed, which enable us to look at the origins of starting capital and the building of a portfolio over the working life of a, a trader or a businessman. And inside that, a, a, set, a set of very minute questions, I see this as a big sort of clock with a pendulum and then a little watch inside, where we look at the money, commodity, money sub-circuit. We look at the, the conditions of costs and returns um, in the latest period, the latest post-harvest season. So we look at a business history and the history of accumulation of bankruptcy, of portfolio development, which is in a way, okay. Um, the, ex, the, the extractive role of, of markets in relation to agriculture. And then we also look at the rate of return, the relationship between costs, activities, and profits um, in trade. So I've done this in two parts of India, one at over 25 years in West Bengal, and one over 44 years in northern Tamil Nadu. And I suppose what I will finish with is that what we find is the coexistence of differentiation and accumulation on the one hand um, with technological change, um, labor displacement, accumulation on a much bigger scale than is possible in landed agriculture itself. Um, the the, the uh, evolution of diversity in the modes of accumulation the entry of rentier accumulation, rentier portfolios um, in parts of India that was riot worry, which were characterized by smallholder agriculture. Um, integration into the national and perhaps even international markets. Um, and all this coexisting sort of micro conglomerate capital, that's both and Chattapadi's um, phrase for it, all coexisting with um, petty trade and petty production in the system of markets, just as petty production persists in agriculture itself. So petty production persists in niches, little processing um, activity, in separate circuits of the agrarian economy, in the periodic marketplace system, in particular sectors like bullet carts and lorries. I'm going to finish. New services like mechanical repair. I'm, it's okay, I'm looking at the time. And what this means is that petty production um, produces a social surplus. It's not just simple reproduction that Henry talked about ticking over, nor is it expanded reproduction, but a certain amount of social surplus is created in such a way that firms can expand by multiplication. And so we have a quite persistent um, uh, subclass of petty traders, petty service providers, petty producers in the system of markets, just as we have it in agriculture, um, which expand on inheritance or at marriage or by the Sharachari route through savings, which are more or less autonomous. Um, and there's a politics, can well, I, I'm stopping, there's a politics yes, of please. accumulation, um, which uh, which is separate from the politics of petty production. And why is this important? Well, we'll, we'll it may be considered to be a development problem 
It's a, or it may be considered to be a development the potential. So if we go on, I'm sorry. Right now, it's being destroyed through demonetization. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That well, this is this is uh, th these are heated moments when when the when the chair intervenes. I'm sorry if I intervened wrongly, but I don't think so. Uh, Barbara thinks so. Uh, but thanks anyway uh, for, 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 for this outlining of, of pity production and how that as a system continues uh, and, and continues to expand and, and what that means for, for agrarian change and, and the issues we're dealing with here. Of course, will be something we return to in, in the question and answer session. And now we will rush on to the end hour. You will rush on to Yandao, you said. I just saw what rushing means. Uh, <laughs> very well. Thank you, Jens. Uh, anyway, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I will talk about agrarian questions uh, of today, not those of the past. I will focus on uh, agrarian questions as they emerge in, uh, in our epoch. Uh, this image will help a little bit as introduction. It refers to the uh, flows, the flows of... Uh, agricultural commodities, the enormous flows of commodities that go from one side of the globe uh, to the other. You never know exactly, uh, you might know what's in uh, these silos, but you do not understand uh, whether it's for human uh, food, whether it's for animal feeding, whether it's for energy production, whether it's for speculation. It might uh, have different objectives. Uh, and of course, it implicitly refers to uh, those who are in control. Those who control these flows nowadays have an enormous uh, power. Uh, when talking about uh, agriculture, um, we have to be keen on the fact that the way agricultural production is organized, the way it's developing, the way it's developing its resources, is to be in balance uh, with both society, with the actors involved in uh, agriculture, and with nature. Yeah, if, if there are major disarticulations along these axes, then uh, an, uh, an uh, uh, agrarian question emerges. Uh, we have had major disarticulations between the way agricultural production was organized and nature, for instance, uh, in the previous century in, uh, in the USA, when the Dust Bowl swept uh, the continent. Uh, it's beautifully described by John Ste Steinbeck in uh, Grapes of Wrath. Yeah, that was a major disarticulation between uh, agricultural production and nature. When uh, the prospects and uh, interests of uh, the farming population are really trodden uh, by the mainland labor institutions, uh, then uh, you have, let's say, the classical agrarian question. Then often uh, land reform is emerging as a need. That happened in the past. That's still happening today. Uh, that was what happened in China when the uh, collectivist organization uh, of agricultural production ran counter to uh, the, the interests and the view of the farming population. And this gave rise to the enormous uh, Anhui uh, rebellion that, that, that changed uh, the landscape in China. And of course, uh, it is to be, uh, there is to be a balance between society at large and agricultural production. Yeah, an, an example of disarray emerging there are the current food scares. Yeah, then there is definitely something wrong. Um, agricultural production is to be in balance with these uh, different uh, blocks. Uh, and when a major uh, disarticulation occurs, we have an agrarian uh, question, we have an agrarian crisis. Now, talking about the agrarian crisis of today, we have to take into account that it's a global crisis. It emerges everywhere, although in different ways, with different forms, but they are interconnected. Yet the fate of the peasantries in the global north and the global south are interconnected. Uh, it is... Uh, a global crisis. It is a crisis that for the first time in history regards all these uh, balances. All these balances currently are in disarray. And it's in the third place a kind of Gordian knot. It cannot, the more you try to resolve one problem, the more you aggravate the other problems. It's, it's really a Gordian knot. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, 
to uh, get, and, and this uh, relates very much with the markets. This is an image of uh, markets in the past, uh, a previous century in uh, the west of Russia. Yeah, markets then were regional markets. It was an archipelago of different markets, interconnected, but always a little bit at the same time independent. Yeah, they met uh, local history, they met uh, local ecolo ecological conditions. Uh, now, it's still remarkable that worldwide 85% of all food is traded still within regional markets. Only 15% of food crosses literally uh, uh, national uh, boundaries, becomes part of the world market. Nonetheless, a world market, of course, is terribly important because it's where uh, the, these, these, the food empires are located. These are the large uh, global networks, monopolistic networks, that increasingly control both the production of food, uh, the processing of food, the distribution of food, and increasingly, as well, the consumption of food. Yet these networks, these food empires, control the different uh, uh, regional markets, can impose uh, their regime in uh, the parameters, their conditions, in all these uh, uh, different uh, localities. Yeah? And this gives rise to new relations, relations of domination and relations of appropriation. Uh, Increasingly, it's a kind of uh, appropriation of the extractivist uh, kind. Uh, these empires uh, grow very quickly, mainly through takeovers. Uh, they represent an enormous power, are at the same time uh, fragile. Uh, um, and they exert a, a range of consequences about uh, <coughs> agriculture, about agriculture wherever it is located. The first is loss of control. States and farmers are increasingly out of control. Food sovereignty is indeed uh, threatened. Uh, <coughs> this is an image of Latin America. I like it very much. It's enigmatic. You don't understand very well whether the peasants <coughs> are at the fringe of the system or whether they are still in the center of it, or whether this is both the case. Uh, I will return to this one uh, later on. Uh, apart from loss of control, there is increasingly an artificialization of food. Yeah, food is to be transported of long distances in time and uh, space. This is having negative consequences for society as a whole. Uh, there is a tying up of the squeeze on agriculture. Yeah, incomes are, poverty is increasingly uh, a widespread uh, phenomenon. There is financialization. Uh, you could say that, that agricultural systems are what Greece and Italy uh, are for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for the European Union. Yeah, the, the degree of uh, financialization in both primary production and in processing is extremely high, and this introduces uh, all kinds of new uh, 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 dangers and, uh, and, and and the risk of volatility. Finally, there is a <coughs> massive destruction of uh, of nature, and all this, of course, uh, is having uh, a, a very a multiple uh, consequences for for food security. At the same time, this makes that as as a reaction that new need, needs, new scarcities are emerging. Uh, Worldwide, but especially in Africa, but in other places as well, there's a very urgent need for rural uh, employment. Sweet water is becoming uh, one of these new scarcities. Uh, uh, to have enough food uh, of uh, good quality, of uh, reasonable prices, yeah, is becoming uh, again an urgent uh, priority uh, in many places. And the Maghreb is uh, just one example, but far from being uh, the only one. Uh, having an attractive countryside, both in China and in Europe, this is a uh, very important issue. When it comes to the nature side, uh, yeah, the, the issue of climate change, all the environmental problems, uh, yeah, they are massively and, and, and they are enlarged increasingly. They are to be uh, resolved. And then finally, there again, throughout Europe, throughout uh, Central Asia and other places, in uh, Canada it's the same, yeah, the need for acceptable incomes. Uh, everywhere uh, farmers and peasants are downtrodden. The possibilities to develop their own farms are uh, limited. 
And at the crossroads of these new needs, new scarcities, yeah, and these are major, major ingredients of the new agrarian crisis, of the global agrarian crisis we are witnessing, at the crossroads uh, of these needs, these needs that cannot be resolved by capital, uh, rather it's the other way around, they are aggravated uh, by capital. Four minutes. Uh, how many minutes? Four. You're very generous. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I will argue that at the, at the crossroads of these uh, new needs, these new scarcities, uh, a, a transition is going on, a new agriculture is being wrought, and there are emerging new peasantries. Those are peasants uh, different from the peasants of the past, also there is uh, quite some continuity, but they articulate in a new way towards uh, current uh, uh, society. Uh, these are three... Uh, young peasants from uh, where I come from, from Friesland and the Netherlands. Uh, they are engaged in the management of uh, landscape and biodiversity here. What is very important for them is have an autonomous resource base, yeah, which, allows, uh, which allows for a defense against capital, against uh, food empires. What's very important for them uh, is also uh, to be not dependent only of farming, but to be engaged in a wider range of activities like uh, the management of nature and landscape here, or being like uh, this example from uh, Italy, uh, being directly uh, engaged in uh, processing of fresh milk and in its uh, commercialization. As a matter of fact, uh, you note everywhere uh, in Europe, but also in Asia, in uh, the Americas, the emergence of uh, new markets. The, the, the Big markets con are controlled by uh, food empires. Yeah, they, food empires are an obligatory passage point for products to go, for the flows to go from uh, producers to consumers. What you increasingly see is that uh, new markets are being constructed. Uh, yeah, they emerge as a kind of bypasses. Yeah, the peasant markets are constructed that uh, allow for direct uh, contacts, direct transactions between uh, uh, producers and consumers, and indeed this means that you you have to study very carefully uh, the markets. Yeah, the, the India argument of uh, Barbara is, uh, is, is now valid, is, is emerging everywhere. More generally speaking, I think one can argue that uh, the multiple uh, contradictions between food empires and new peasantries, uh, contradictions that are deepening, uh, will be our major uh, f uh, fields of combat where capital is contested. And these struggles are especially strong, and here comes an important point, because peasants, wherever it is uh, in the global north, in the global south, can draw on two very important commons. They have access to land, to nature, to resources, to seeds, to animals, and if not, they can fight for it, they can defend it. Yeah, but that's one thing. And the other common is the right to food, yeah, as existing in society at large, in the cities. And by combining, by drawing upon uh, these uh, uh, two commons, uh, peasants are able to face uh, food empires to respond actively to it. Uh, they are not anymore the subordinated peasantry of the past. They are actively constructing new alternatives. They, they start small, are increasingly interconnected, and become a main driver of uh, further transitions. Uh, one last uh, point. Often the question is asked, can they feed uh, the world, these uh, peasants, these new peasants? We did uh, in Italy a uh, study that uh, went on for uh, some 40 years now, comparing a peasant agriculture, yeah, taking data from Italy itself, with entrepreneurial farming. And you see that, uh, I will not go into details, the, the, the important point is that time and again, be it in the 70s, in the 80s, 90s, and in this century, peasant farming was more productive than entrepreneurial farming. If very system integrated, high technology, etc. Peasant farming was more productive and it became more productive over time. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for
for these very rich uh, presentations, we, which uh, we will now have a have a have a round of questions. But before that, I will uh, I will allow for a quick comment from each of of the of the uh, panelists. Uh, if if you so want to comment on, on no, you are saying no. Would you like a quick comment on any of the other aspects that have been brought up here? There, there are issues of global systems where there clearly are differences. There are issues of, 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 of which classes are we talking about here, where there clearly are differences, just to mention two. Um, We will move straight to questions. There are many hands. Uh, let us start from, uh, um, where should we start from? Uh, um, Jonathan. We will take a number of questions and then return to, to, to the panel for comments, please. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Really quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Let us take answers now, uh, or at least debates. And, and we've had a number of questions that have been directed to individuals, but I think you should treat them as directed to all of you, because the issue of what is the peasants now, uh, uh, why are they new, for example, is an issue that many of you might want to to uh, to uh, to to uh, come in on. We'll start from my left, Jan Dauer. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, new peasants, uh, why? why? Why do I call them that way? Uh, in the first place, uh, because increasingly people are not constrained anymore to be a peasant. Be being a peasant increasingly is, in many places of the world, the outcome of uh, free choices, of goal-oriented choices. People opt for being uh, uh, a peasant. Secondly, peasants are not anymore a sack of potatoes. They have movements, they have organizations, they have leaders, they have their patterns and means of communication. Yep, very important. Uh, third, these new peasantries create alliances and exist uh, due to alliances with uh, urban uh, classes. Uh, finally, you could 
would say, because they constitute themselves as peasantry. That's exactly what happened in uh, China. That's what uh, happens uh, in uh, Brazil uh, due to the land occupations by the uh, Movimento dos uh, Sem Terra. And finally, I call them peasants because, because they call themselves uh, peasants. It's also uh, a symbol of protest against the modernization script that has been uh, uh, used uh, and imposed by the states uh, both in the south and in the north, in the east and in the west, yeah, and people take distance from that. They do consciously so and they start to redefine themselves as peasants, just as uh, their uh, main international uh, uh, organization, Via Campesina, is called uh, explicitly that way. And, yeah, and how do you see what, what you were just saying there? Uh, in relation to categories such as pity commodity production or such as classes of labor to take some of the other categories that have been put forward here? Yeah, well, analytically, I've used uh, the concept of pity commodity uh, uh, production uh, also, uh, but I think it's, it's not adequate anymore to describe uh, the current constellation. Currently, uh, Peasants produce for markets, that's absolutely no issue of uh, subsistence whatsoever. They produce for markets, but try at the same time to be as independent from markets as possible. That is, on the, on the output side, yeah, they go to markets. On the input side, they try to be as self-provisioning as possible. Yeah? They try to build their own uh, self-controlled uh, resource base. Uh, so you could say this is a step beyond uh, the, the simple uh, concept of, uh, of pity commodity production, the more so when you take into account uh, diversification and multifunctionality, uh, pluriactivity, that means being with one f food in the countryside and other food in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the urban economies. Uh, uh, I think we have to enrich previous concepts yeah, in order to meet current conditions that drastically differ from those of the past. Thanks. Barbara? Thank you for the questions. Um, the first one was about demonetization. Um, petty commodity producers and traders and service providers and petty money lenders are predominantly dealing in a cash economy. When you take 80% of cash away, you are um, threatening their very livelihood. Um, in the English language Indian press over the last three weeks since the 8th, no, months since the 8th of November, there have been a number of different reports about the effect of demonetization on agriculture. Um, some say that because uh, the farmers don't expect there to be demand because the demand would have been in the currency notes that have been rendered illegal, that supply has dropped to markets and so has demand, so that there's been no change in prices. Raj Shekhar, going out in Bihar a week ago, found catastrophic declines in prices for vegetables and fruit um, in markets in Bihar. Right now, we only know about the likely effect through more or less um, reason, speculation, and through case studies that journalists are making going out into the countryside. But there is no evidence that petty producers are benefiting from demonetization. The only evidence is pointing to a massive threat to their livelihoods. Um, on political coherence, um, there is no political project for petty producers. Um, they may be allowed to uh, enter business associations of capitalists, um, but, only, but, but their demands are usually ignored. As labor, I explained in my talk, they're disenfranchised. Petty production for itself, politically, only through SEWA, which has organized two million women, which is a, a huge achievement until you realize that there are still about 150 million people left to organize. Um, and the Maoists, who have an analysis, a very nuanced analysis of petty production, but draw the conclusion that they're reliable allies of the Maoists, um, which is a dubious conclusion. 
they, there is a politics of organization in sectors which are dominated by petty producers or petty traders like bullet carts and lorries. And that politics is defensive. I don't have time to talk about it. But um, in the paper for Henry, I did describe it. Um, James's question, uh, could they persist indefinitely? Well, they have persisted um, long before they were labeled. Um, and I think that uh, provided they have means of transacting, financial means, currency notes, they will continue to persist. But it, it is true that if you look at the state and ask the question, are, does the state have an economic project as opposed to a political one for this form of production, it's all over the place. There are interventions which destroy, interventions which create and support, like microcredit, interventions which tolerate, like marketplaces, and interventions like NREGA, which act as a kind of un unintended outcome in support of petty production. So my own personal conclusion is that this, there's a chaotic economic project for petty production and that some kind of uh, coherence is needed um, however, the opposite is happening. The last question, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Um, what was the direction of travel? Uh, what is the direction of travel? The direction of travel seems to be the, the coexistence of a two track in the countryside towards accumulation, but also towards the persistence of petty production. And I could talk about this at length, but won't. Um, uh, but, in, but there are huge <laughs> trade-offs in the direction of travel. It's causing a terrible crisis of water depletion. And um, those of you who think that organic rice is somehow better and more nature friendly need to know that as long as organic rice is being produced with irrigation water, then it has a, a CO2 emissions factor, which is almost as heavy as, as, um, as uh, intensive rice because most of the CO2 in rice production is, is in the coal, in the electricity that is used to raise the water. I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Uh, could, could I just ask you, so, so in your view, uh, do people become peasants by choice? To take a, a, a point put forward before. Uh, Barbara? No, I think there are no peasants anymore. So peasants, um, if people call themselves peasants, that's a term of art. It's a political term. But technically, my own reading of the literature is that peasants are people incompletely involved in imperfect markets who can withdraw into subsistence at times of crisis, who are subordinated to other classes in the state. And, and that this capacity to withdraw into subsistence is something that the Dutch peasants do not have, I don't think. So I would want to call them something else, and that's why I use the term petty producer. Thanks. Henry? Um, well, James asked a very specific question, which um, is a very straightforward question about an unbelievably complicated yes. social reality, which is that of agrarian change in China today. Um, there was a special issue of the Journal of Agrarian Change last year on this, with the, all the substantive case studies by middle and younger generation Chinese scholars, which makes it unusual. Um, the general kind of position put there, which is a kind of creeping development of capitalism in the countryside, is very different from the position that Yan Dower has put together with um, his colleague and indeed mine at the China Agriculture University, Ye Jing Zhong, in, in a new book. Uh, I would say the curious should read both. Uh, but I think, I think the point I was making was um, about, about collective forms or state collective forms of production, which I, I don't think exists in China anymore, except on a few very big state farms, in fact, um, growing on you know, grain and other field crops on a very large scale using mechanized means and so on. It's very, it's very complicated in China because there, there's an article a few years ago, you probably know it by Peter Ho, something like who owns the land in China. And 
the answer, I mean, he's a Chinese, China scholar, he's, the answer is well, nobody really knows. So it's not that there is a clear legal basis for common property rights or collective property rights from which rents can be drawn, but people will fight over it. And if you're if your half your commune or your former commune farmland is seized to build high-rise luxury apartments, then the people who may be moved out as a result of that think that they have a right to press for some, you know, share of the um, of 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 the booty. But what what's what's interesting, and there are some examples in the contributions, empirical contributions by Chinese scholars in the special issue of the Journal of Agrarian Change is issues about renting out land for farming and for larger scale capitalized farming enterprises and then this extremely obscure and difficult issue about what cooperatives mean in China where the law as well as you know politics or at least rail politic allows entrepreneurs to set up cooperatives as a particular form which enables them to access land and other resources, well, including political favours, of course, from local government. Um, otherwise, I just want to say that um, I realise, if I can briefly, my presentation may have sort of um, uh, pointed too much towards the past. I mean, we, I think the history is enormously... Uh, important and it does enter Barbara's work and Jan Dower's work as well of course um, and one of the you know, key issues in the my debate with Terry is whether that internalist problematic of agrarian change agrarian transition can be carried over from those classic historical instances to today I mean that's actually one of the things that he and I um, argue about Otherwise, I'm very pleased, having argued these matters in a very comradely fashion for so many years with Jan Dower, to hear this notion of peasants as choice. Because, you know, as a social scientist, which may, sh may, may highlight my own shortcomings, I never thought that people were members of classes or social categories by, by choice, and and there is, I think, an underlying logic to this. I mean, to Yandel's position, which I think is very clear in his excellent little book on peasants and the art of farming, his his Chinovian manifesto. Because um, Yandel argues, I don't think I'm misquoting him here. If I am, he'll correct me. That the principal feature of peasant existence, as well as peasant practice, aspiration, desire, and so on, is for autonomy. Now, to me, I, 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 I understand why he's arguing it. I can't see it as an empirical data. Mm. I don't see it as an empirical reality. And I, I, I would also ask Barbara, and this is not disingenuous, this is from real curiosity, whether the sort of new peasants that Yandar was talking about, whether you know of their existence in India and on any significant scale. And I will just let the two other members uh, have a brief comment, brief comment to, to these questions before we take more questions. Jan? Well, markets in which today's uh, peasants are operating are imperfect markets because it are markets heavily controlled by food empires and these agricultural producers, the peasants, are incompletely integrated in these markets. They try to keep markets at a distance, especially the markets for the main resources, for seeds, for animals, for feed, for fodder, for fertilizers, you mentioned it, for capital. So that's the first observation. I mean, I know very well this classical uh, definition, which has been specified further by Frank Ellis. Uh, but if you take it seriously, it means that you can uh, uh, receive uh, peasantries also in the in the northern parts of uh, of the world. 
then uh, camp peasants, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, this is a nice provocation of Barbara, uh, uh, could uh, Dutch peasants withdraw in subsistence? Well, the point is this. Yeah, there is a heavy economic and financial crisis, which due to the financialization of agriculture beats very heavily, but it's <coughs> a partial effect, yeah? it's differentiated. It are the big farms, the entrepreneurial farms that have expanded quickly, high tech, uh, are very dependent on inputs who suffer now periods of negative cash flow. And there is nothing they can do. Yeah, the sparse dependency, they are bound to this uh, trajectory. Yeah, and they go out. You see this in the Netherlands, you see this in uh, Denmark, you see this increasingly in other countries. Yeah, th these subgroups of entrepreneurial farms who took uh, and implemented the script of modernization, yeah, they are entrapped. Indeed, what I call peasants are able to face uh, the crisis. They are resilient. I do not call it anymore a subsistence, but if you want to, to fool around with, with <coughs> old concepts, yes, they can, they can defend themselves. Yeah, they, they have distanciated themselves from the logic that food empires, or more generally speaking, capital has tried to impose on agriculture. And then coming to the issue of own uh, choice, as soon as you go to the detailed statistics, you see first that uh, over time there are farms that are continuous, there are farms that disappear, and there is always an inflow of farms. Yeah, young people are wanting to become farmers, to become peasants themselves. Yeah, and there are mechanisms to do so. Increasingly, the children of farmers, whether it's in Peru or in the Netherlands, or in Italy for that matter, they decide themselves whether to continue a farm, yeah, or whether to stop, or whether to change it completely, to find uh, new pathways, uh, more peasant-like pathways. Uh, so there is a considerable choice in all this. Okay. Uh, you're not, uh, indeed, you encounter the conditions yeah, the historical conditions under which you operate, you can, cannot change those, but there is room for maneuver within those conditions yeah, that, that imply choices, uh, that imp uh, imply struggles. Uh, many <coughs> peasants experience their own choices as struggles. Yeah, it's an ongoing struggle to, to, to remain uh, uh, peasant and to defend uh, their farm. Thanks. Barbara? I'm not sure about new peasants in India. Um, there is a class of person who's highly educated, who farms by choice. Um, some of those are gentlemen farmers. So that wouldn't be what you're talking about, I don't think. We haven't really talked about scale. Um, in the project that... Uh, we had in Oxford looking at greenhouse gases in this whole system of rice. Um, about, we discovered that about 1% of farms in Andhra Pradesh were practicing SRI, systems of rice intensification. But that uses water and it also uses um, chemical inputs, but far less than in intensive agriculture. So the greenhouse gases are less than intensive agriculture, but they're still quite a lot. And as I said, uh, people who are practicing organic agriculture are really hard to find, far fewer than 1% of farms. They are scattered. They do provide the kind of farmer's market that you described. They bypass the system of markets and they sell directly to retailers and the, the that rice is consumed on the basis of trust. And that is because certification of organic rice is very costly and adds a premium to the retail price of rice. So there is a system very close to what Yandor was describing, but it's a minute proportion of um, consumers and producers that are involved in it. Thanks. Let us take a Another round of questions. There are um, one, two, three, four hands. Ali. Thank you very much. I just wanted to sort of uh, bring in the issue of uh, employment uh, as a kind of another issue. Uh, uh, and I think Henry talked about this in his papers about today's technology and how it's changing the way we work. Uh, and I think 
not having as much employment potential in industry as it did earlier. And given that the, you know, you talk about the great question being a question of labor uh, today increasingly, uh, do you think there can be a possible kind of uh, meeting of places with the kind of peasant or whatever reconstituting as peasant's position in a situation where industry is not creating enough jobs and you know, uh, we talk about the MST for example as actually being a movement not really of people who, who, are, who were farmers but many who want to be farmers now that due to due to the fact that there's a squeeze uh, on, on jobs. So do you think there can be a possibility of some sort of, kind of coming together of these positions, um, at least as far as policy uh, and politics may be? Thanks. And I think the, the person at the door v v reminds us that we have only got 10 minutes left and we have to be out here of here in 10 minutes. So please, very brief questions. There's the lady behind. Yeah. Yes, you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, please. No, I, I haven't noticed you. I'm sorry. There's no time Be behind. The, I'm sorry. I, I got the, the man in the blue shirt there. The I'm sorry. Oh, interesting. Steve. Short, please. I've just been told we actually should be out of the door in one minute, which I'm not going to stick to. Uh, but uh, this means that we really will have to have a last comment from the three uh, uh, panelists here. Just choose one of the issues that are raised here to, to comment on, please. And we've started there, so let's start. So Barbara, this time, are you happy to okay. start? Yes, happy to start. Um, okay. I'd like to reply simply to Ali's and Steve's question on technology and mechanization and employment because in these systems uh, new technologies are usually labor displacing the state aids and abets it by subsidies and is often very callous because never factors into any plan the costs of the alternative work or of provision of alternative work to the labor that's displaced it just goes into outer space however 
in India because of the social segmentation of markets, which I didn't have time to talk about. The law of one technology doesn't always hold that, uh, a new, that the most efficient technology prevails. That doesn't happen in India. And you have the coexistence of many technologies at different scales, which then um, allow petty producers to compete and often out-compete petty capitalists and larger capitalists. Leave it there. Henry? Um, I'd just say that um, listing the atrocities of contemporary capitalism of all kinds could, I'm sure we could have a round robin here and all uh, chip in many, many factors. I think part of the differences between us is understanding contemporary capitalism and its extraordinary diversity of forms and then proposing what are called solutions. I actually don't have any solutions, or at least solutions that I could explain in one minute. Uh, I Personally, I would never choose to be a peasant, but that might be my problem. <laughs> okay. Henry, you're down. Look, agricultural processes of production are moldable. You can shape them in different ways. And of course, this relates uh, also with the technologies uh, that are being used. Uh, here we have to be uh, very keen on the conceptual difference made by Francesca Bray. There are mechanical technologies, and the very large-scale operations, and you have uh, skill-oriented technologies. And especially this latter type of uh, technologies yeah, allow for a lot of employment and imply that uh, agricultural development might occur as a kind of labor-driven uh, process. Yeah, it's an intensification driven forward by the quantity and quality of labor. And this is uh, a crucial uh, point, I think. Yes, uh, in as far as food regimes are concerned, uh, I can go a long way uh, with uh, Philip McMichael. Uh, I would, uh, I myself do not talk about corporate food regime, as he does in relation to the third to the current uh, Regime. I talk about the imperial food regime, but anyway, it just, it's not a completely a matter of words. Uh, but uh, I stop, stop here. Uh, land grabbing, here you open a, a very large discussion uh, that goes, uh, I'm sorry, uh, beyond uh, my minute. Thanks. And before, before I thank everyone, uh, let me just announce that we have a drinks reception afterwards in the, in the staff common room and the seminar series, of course, continues next term and there should be flyers lying around for the seminar series. And now it's time for me to thank the panel for their excellent contribution. Thank you. Thank you.